Yes, we're so starting. Recording. Okay. Recording Fantastic. started. Perfect. All right. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Alpine's 2021 monthly webinar series. This year's theme is book club and what better way to start a year than the Odyssey, right? 2021. Uh, Space Odyssey, we're, we're right there, right? So we're going to buy some enterprise software effectively. Um, we've got the poll up. For those of you that take the poll, we greatly appreciate it. A few housekeeping items. Number one, I'm going to read the dis non-disclosure. The information discussed in today's session represents the views of the individuals and does not constitute legal advice. You should consult with your organization's leadership and legal counsel. Number two, we are recording and the recording will be available as well as the PowerPoint slides after the recording. Uh, we will send a link to all those that registered and it will point you to our website. Um, number three, please note, everybody is muted. So this is an interactive session. So please feel free to use the Q&A or the chat for all questions. Uh, as your moderator, I will be reviewing them and answering near real time. So for that being said, let's go to the first slide there. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Michael Woolwin, and I am your moderator today. I am based in St. Charles, Illinois, and I have been in the supply chain space for just over 30 years. Uh, I think I've installed darn near close to 70 plus warehouse management systems, and um, I spent eight years in the ERP space and uh, 10 years in the WMS space. So uh, what's interesting is uh, when we do consulting engagements, we have empathy for both sides of the equation, uh, working for the software company, helping our clients, and then also the implementation side of it. So I am your moderator, Michael Woolen. With me today uh, is our very good friend of mine. Uh, we were talking about how long we've known each other now, but Tom leverages more than 40 years of supply chain execution consulting experience as a warehouse manager, software solutions architect, a project lead for two different software companies, an RFID solution provider. And for those of you that might remember, Tom also was with the Gartner Group and the Aberdeen Group. So uh, I like to say that Tom Ryan was the first software police out there. Dwight Clappage holds that role right now. Uh, in addition, uh, Tom was the director of technology CIO for a startup, uh, 3PL. Uh, enterprise application and creation practice leader, and an independent supply chain consultant. He has led on software selections for small companies all the way up to $8 billion in enterprises, enabling clients to replace and upgrade their enterprise systems to support continued growth. So through Tom's experience, he has evaluated many supply chain executive operations, systems, and brought together a successful multi-year program. So with that being said, uh, Dave, can you show us the poll results? So that way we get a little bit of a feel for kind of what we're here. So a lot of people um, are considering a, um, input, uh, a selection in greater than 24 months. Some are not considering at all. And if you've completed a selection, no. And then some within the last 12 to 24 months. So you can close those polls. Now that we know a little bit about our clients or our um participants today. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Tom, and uh, let you kind of review the high-level agenda. So uh, thank you very much, Michael. That was uh, very nice of you uh, in that uh, introduction. So as we go through this agenda, the focus is, you know, enterprise selection software. How can you, how can you effectively get it? It's a trip. It's a, tri uh, it's a, a tour. It's an odyssey. So as we look at this, the first things we want to consider and we're going to try to cover here in the, in the presentation day is, you know, what are we trying to avoid? How do we make sure that we're not one of those um, press releases about the most recent failure of implementations of some software? We're going to talk about what works, what doesn't from our perspective. We're going to give you a, our methodology or a model on how to be successful at this. We call it the six steps to success. And then we're going to summarize with, uh, you know, what does it really take for you to be able to succeed at doing this? So first up, you know, what are we trying to avoid? You know, the reality is when you look at how software systems implementations fail, you can, you can blame the software vendor, 
you can blame the integrator, but based on a lot of university studies, uh, supply chain departments and whatnot, where they've done some significant research, it really boils down to about 80% of the time, it's the buyer's fault. And um, I've been involved in uh, expert witness litigation, and uh, which I jokingly refer to as software implementation failure forensic pathology. How did this thing die and who killed it? Uh, that's when, when, when they invite us in to do that kind of work, no one's looking at working with each other anymore. They're looking at how to uh, shoot each other probably is an easy way to say it. But anyhow, what is it that these studies have found uh, with regard to how they can, how these implementations can fail? You can see um, many of these bullet points here that are talking. I try not to read my, read my own bullet points in doing these things. But I think one of the easy traps is trying to maintain the status quo. You know, the new softwares that we have today, especially cloud solutions, they don't let you modify uh, a, a lot of the, the implementation. They make you they'll be flexible with configuration, but they're not going to let you modify. If you're trying to re-implement the status quo with a new label on the software, why are you spending that kind of money? Uh, a lot of people get very dissatisfied with those projects, and they often turn into be very expensive. Or the organization has unrealistic expectations about where we're going to do, what we're going to do it, and how we're going to do it. My, my story about that is, you know, people, everybody wants to go to the moon. All the projects that are successful go to the moon. But they went to Earth, low Earth orbit first. And so when you look at who's successful, the people who are successful to set the expectation, we're going to take us to the moon, but we're going to stop in low Earth orbit and work our way there in phases or steps. Uh, the ones who fail are the ones who say we're going to the moon, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead, and then they land in Earth orbit. So that it's all about having uh, the right focus, the right organizational commitment, and, and the right plan. So when you look at it, it's the vendor and the implementation. They both matter. So when you look at what works and what doesn't work, you can't focus mostly on the software or mostly on the implementation. The best software with a poor implementation plan, team execution is gonna be a failure. The best uh, implementation with the worst software or with a poor fit on the software, it's gonna to fail too. But if you're doing a reasonable to excellent job in picking your software and doing your implementation plan and execution of the implementation, you're looking at how you could succeed. So the, how does, what is, how, what does it take us to see? How do you go about doing this? Well, it, you need to go beyond. So now that you scared everybody, Tom, about what not to do, let's talk about what we should do. How about that? Huh? There we go. All right. So <laughs> when we, you know, and that, that, you know, you, you, you saw urgency and, and sense of uh, what, what is my problem and what do I need to deal with? So we, we call it the six steps to success where you look in the, the icon, uh, the graphic on the right, you know, it's about the consultant, the business case, how you develop, uh, how you evaluate and choose your partner, how you plan for your implementation, how do you execute the implementation, and how do you do global if that's a problem for you. The basic idea is you need to get beyond the mechanics of just executing the steps. You want to work at achieving buy-in, you know, having the right experiences uh, in your organization to do this, having uh, credibility or empowerment to your people, listening to them, not lecturing them, and, and involve them. Do the due diligence on the software, the technology, the vendor, their integrator. Don't take shortcuts there. Don't rush it. This is a 10 to 15 year partnership. Uh, do you really need to get it done four weeks faster? You know, I mean, think about that for a minute. Contracting, you got to do the right kind of stuff. Unfortunately, contracting is to make sure you protect yourself in the event that you run into that problem of uh, implementation failure. But it's also about making sure everybody understands what their roles and, and responsibilities are. You know, the old joke is that good, na uh, good fences make good neighbors. That's kind of what a contract is. Understand the boundaries and, and, and how we're gonna work together. And then execution, it really gets down to having the right project management plan and uh, an office in place, a strategy that allows you to do this in steps. We'll talk more about change management and scope and budget control. And so, Tom, I think what you're saying is that um, on the previous slide there, I mean, the 
process that we're going to walk through will address all of those, but above and beyond, you know, just going through a selection helps get the buy-in. You're, you're doing your due diligence. Obviously, you leverage outside or inside counsel on the contracting, and then, you know, you got to execute, right? So those are the things that are a byproduct or will come to fruition by doing a, a selection. Correct. I mean, the six steps will enable you to uh, satisfy uh, the things of the four bullet, the four pillars, if you will, over on the right. And but it's the existence of those four pillars that will help you be successful. Fantastic. Great. Thanks for the clarification. So consulting expertise. I mean, what are we talking about here? The reality is in most IT operations uh, and quite honestly, a lot of these solutions uh, feel like an IT project, although they really shouldn't be just an IT project. They, should, they are an operations project. Uh, but many organizations have never bought software. I mean, they, they have people who've maintained them. They have had people that modified them. They've had people that have gone through uh, upgrades and upgraded them. But to sit back and say, what are our requirements and what is something new that we want to get to replace what we have? Um, very few companies have the staff to do that. There is a bit of a, a, a unique selection or skill set associated with selection that drives around those four bullet points, you know, vendor experience, understanding the industry you're in, how does that apply, what are the solution applications and implementation experience that the, the people have that have gone through this before. This is where you can typically you're going to potentially look for a consulting company to help you do that. And as you go through that, you know, you're looking at these imperatives for how you drive your selection and how will your consulting uh, support or your own internal skill sets drive these imperatives. One is objectivity, risk management, leadership, objectivity. It's the legacy versus the new, vendor versus vendor, risk. What do I do to build buy-in or confidence that we're all, we're all in this project together and we're all in agreement that we're doing the right thing? What behaviors might that we do might help ensure our success and mitigate risk? You know, the leadership piece, move the organization forward, uh, guide us through internal interests and requirements, be very deliberative. The reality is, the, uh, go ahead, Tom, I'm sorry. No, I'm gonna say the reality is this is about deliberative, uh, methodical processes. It's very easy to let emotion get in the way of making a good decision. Mike, you were gonna say? Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, the one thing that I always like to say is that every project is kind of like a whitewater rafting adventure. No matter what happens, you're going to get to the end because gravity is going to get you there. The question is, is are you going to do it on time and on value? And are you going to mitigate and minimize any carnage along the way? So leveraging a consultant at the back of the, the boat to tell you when the paddle left, when the paddle right, and how to get down that, that whitewater rapid um, the right way on time and on value. So are you going to be in the boat? Or are you going to be floating behind the boat? Right? I'm in the boat. <laughs> so business case, it's important to establish a business case. And, but the business cases may not be solely financially driven, but you need to understand why you're going through this process. Why do you want to do this? And that case needs to be grassroots up. The management has their own reasons for doing it. But if you're involving the grassroots and building the business case, they're beginning to feel involvement and commitment to the decision that you're looking for them to make. Uh, you want a consulting group that's gonna work in collaboration with your team and supplement what your team's skills are. Not somebody that is coming in to do a, a, a white glove approach and do all the work for you because that doesn't help with building buy-in. At the same time, you want to focus on where we want to take the business, not just where we are in the business today, but you need to do that in a way that uh, doesn't forget doing the business that you have today. Because when you install the new software, you, you're enabling the future, but you still got to operate today. So at this point, you're also beginning to set uh, expectations with regard to cost and timing impact. We tell you to go through and develop a 10-year total cost of ownership. What do I mean by that? Well, the reason for looking at a 10-year cost of ownership, a lot of people are comparing an on-premise solution versus a cloud solution. Cloud solutions look very attractive because in the first five years, they don't have uh, the total cost of them over a five-year timeframe 
with, because they don't have that big capital infusion at the beginning that an on-prem solution typically has, they look very, look very positive. But when you go beyond five years, you'll probably find, depending on the scope of the product, I mean, if you're doing a WMS, it might be less than uh, seven years. If you're doing an ERP, it might be uh, sooner than that that you will see that those cross lines between a, a, a cloud solution and a on-prem solution will cross. And, uh, but it's getting harder and harder to buy on-prem solutions uh, today. So, uh, but that's why you wanna do the 10 year TCO. The other way I like to approach this is we wanna set an expectation that we, will, that we will be better than when we have more information. If we're gonna have sticker shock, either whether it be cost or time or effort, uh, internal effort. Now's the time to get through that before you spend all of the effort and money associated with uh, trying to go through a selection. And the other thing is, is with that business case, if in the event a new SVP of supply chain comes in, a new CIO comes in, you got an anchor document, you know why you're doing the project and the value for it. Very good. The selection itself. Okay, selections need to focus on a life in the, a day in the life a day in the life that goes after the 2B direction while remembering I still have to execute an as is environment or my operation today. You wanna require vendors load your data so that when, they, when you look at their demonstrations, uh, you're seeing something that you can relate to. I mean, if, if you're uh, making potato chips, you don't wanna see a demonstration that talks about bicycles, uh, for example. Uh, you don't want to give them everything. You don't want to kill them with making them load up a lot of data, but you want to have sample, uh, information in there that, that your people will relate to. Um, you want to be focused and driven uh, objectively. So I tend to, I'm an old engineer, so I love to have my scorecards and I love to have my uh, checklists and my uh, questions and, and all that good stuff. And But I tell people that when we have numbers, if the numbers don't line up with our subjective impression of what we've seen or what we've evaluated, then we need to be able to answer that. We need to either figure out why the numbers are better or worse, and what is it that about our subjective uh, impression, we need to reconcile. You need to balance them both, but you want to keep the, the emotion out of it. You want to work through contract negotiations, although they're tedious, and it, it's almost impossible to predict how long they're taking. You want to be able to work ways out that where the vendors continue to have skin in the game, because I mean, you're there for the life. Uh, how are you going to keep them there for the life? And the other point is when you get down towards the final end of it, you want to have a vendor of choice, but you also want to have an alternate and you want to work in good faith with both of them uh, because you know yours won't be the first project where the during the negotiation, the vendor of choice blows up uh, and you can't come to an agreement. Well, you want to go back to your alternate, but you don't want to have done anything prior to that that would, you know, sour your alternate's attitude about you. And um, I, I can tell you firsthand that uh, it, it's very rare, but it does happen. And uh, so sometimes, you know, getting everything with regards to the requirements, the sales process, but at the legal side, you, you can't come to an agreement. So you always want to be careful and make sure that uh, you have two finalists and um, proceed with caution on both sides. And the other part about this execution, evaluation, and selection is your executive sponsor has a very important role here to empower the team and make sure that everybody has a good, open, clear vote. Um, we just recently had a, um, a selection process where we went around the room and we let all the other constituents speak before the two executive sponsors spoke. Um, so that way they had an opportunity to you know, really share their perspective and their feelings. And um, so that's important. And we'll absolutely talk more about that as we continue here. Well, I agree. And following along with what you said, I've actually done an implementation uh, selection process where I had like 79 people were involved on the team after the demonstrations to choose the winner. And I have always been able to get my customers to come to a unanimous agreement with regard to who they were going to choose. Everybody was involved throughout the whole scenario. Everybody got to see, well, this is great for me, but it won't work for them. Uh, you know, I, I, 
I can't execute the order, but they have a really good system for taking the order. Well, that doesn't mean you're actually going to have a successful operation and people could see that. That helps build the involvement, build the consensus and, and come to a unanimous decision. So we'll go on from there. Implementation strategy. I think the biggest piece I want to make here is that you, when you go into the selection, you want to have a plan or an idea for how you're going to implement it. Uh, you know, where do you think your phases might be? Where, how, which modules do you think you might want to start up first? Which warehouses or uh, operations offices do you want to start up first? But then you got to realize that the vendor gets a vote. The software gets a vote. They know how to implement their stuff. But they need to hear from you what you think your strategy is. And then during the design processes, you'll, you'll refine it and come to a better position. Just remember the vendor gets a vote because it's their software and they know how to operate it. You do want to plan for phases. I talked earlier about the low earth orbit story. Uh, and when you build an integrated project plan, you need to remember that it's not just about what the vendor is going to get done and when they're going to get done. You owe them stuff to enable them to do their job. They owe you stuff to enable you to do your job. You need to have a program management office that is managing them and you. Uh, it is a team to get it done. You have responsibilities. You need to be focused on yourself as well as on them. Uh, business process reorganization. People often ask about, well, should we go through a business reorganization process before we look at selecting software? And I look at that and say, think about what you, how you might want to reorganize, but go select the software. Again, the software gets a vote. If you do an organization reorganization first, when you buy the software, you're going to do it again because that software is not necessarily going to do the way you reorganized your business to do. I mean, they, they probably didn't do it exactly the way you would have done it before you, you were doing it, before you reorganized it. So you need to do that, but that is actually a piece of implementing the software. And it's all about how do I implement that software? The other thing is if you don't do it first, you do it as a part of the plan, you actually save money because you go through that drill once. And th those drills are uh, disruptive in their own right. But even then, when you get the responses from the different vendors, it's important to note that, you know, you'll see some white glove and you'll see some that will be the same dollar value, but the hours might be double or triple. So it's really pulling back the onion from the vendors and seeing what's in there, what the roles and responsibilities are, the assumptions. So it's, it's really important to really think about your strategy and how it matches with the resource requirements from the potential vendors. And a good example of what Michael is talking about, uh, did a project recently where the vendor assumed that they were doing the lion's share of the heavy lifting uh, to integrate their solution with the uh, existing ERP that they were you know, plugging their WMS into, when the reality was the customer was very, very comfortable with doing uh, their, their own integrations. And that dramatically reduced, like 150 effort hours, dramatically reduced the vendor's uh, contribution, thus reducing the out-of-pocket fees for what they were doing because the customer was very comfortable doing a lot of that work on their own. That's a part of the, the implementation planning process, beginning to understand that. And then finally, let's talk, or not finally, but let's talk about implementation oversight. You know, screwing in software, which is what I like to call implementations, is, is it's not just screwing in the software. You have to manage them. You've got to work your re-engineering stuff. Uh, you've got to focus on uh, cost, vendor performance, obligations. You've got to focus on uh, milestones. When are you getting stuff done? When are they getting stuff done? You got to work on uh, what do I have to do to clean my data, convert my data? You know, how am I going to pilot this or how am I going to do a user acceptance test? All of those things you need to focus on. And that's all about managing the, the activities that will help you be successful in making this happen. Global program management. I know this doesn't apply to everybody, but the reality I want to get to here is when you do a project that is going to involve a global rollout, global rollout you need to focus in one country first, involve other countries for some early information. But the reality is each country, when you move to that country, uh, is, is, is a project of their own. 
I mean, we're, we're predominantly looking at warehouse management systems, but if you were looking at an ERP system and you were going into China, you would have to worry about the golden tax tables. And that's really only about China. Uh, and that's a place where you might actually have to focus on having a Chinese consulting company that's very good at that, make that happen for you. If you're going into France, there's a whole different set of government requirements for how financials are, 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 are filled out. If, uh, depending on the country, there may be certain labor rules and things like that that you need to focus on that is unique to them. In effect, each country is its own rollout, its own project, and some of that stuff will have an international rollback feel, and you might end up pulling some of that new learnings of the next country back into the previous countries. It doesn't apply to everybody, but it does really reinforce the point that you have to have a plan, you have to think this through, and then you have to manage to the plan. Absolutely. We've had a couple of clients, whether it's a WCS global rollout or an ERP global rollout or a WMS global rollout and being able to, you know, think about how you implement in each of the different countries and the IT support and the, and the project teams. And so it's a, it's a daunting task for um, uh, some of those larger organizations in that side. So it's a, uh, it's what we love and uh, it, it can be a challenge on organizations. So you gotta think with the end in mind. So to kind of wrap up our formal presentation part of this uh, time together uh, is to highlight, I'm gonna highlight what we think are the key steps uh, to succeed. Uh, the, you know, what does it take? Strong leadership, executive management has to be bought in and has to be reinforcing the execution of the project, keeping the project on time, holding the project team's feet to the fire and ensuring they have the resources to do what they need to do. Helping uh, um, traffic cop activities or interact with other segments of the business. The selection and implementation teams, they need to be good people. This is a problem. Your good people are needed to run the day to day. You've got to figure out how you're going to make those good people available, uh, how you're going to backfill behind them in order to make them available. Uh, if you don't, you won't have as good an implementation as you might have. Uh, organization change, we talked about that. I had a, 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 a client once where I was talking to him about uh, their order entry process. I said, do you realize you've got four guys who are doing order entry? Their cubicles touch each other. I've interviewed all four of them. They all four do the same job in radically different ways. What do you want to do about that? And he says, well, I thought the new software would uh, force a change on it. I said, yeah, it will. But six months later, they will all be doing it their own way again because they don't have a, a plan. They don't have a, a, a culture that says we do all of this the same way. Now's the time to begin to do that, but you don't build it without involving those people. Focus on the goal. Be deliberative. Have a process or a methodology. The, the key here is have a methodology, not so much what is the methodology. Be deliberative. Uh, successful chain management. We talked about that a little bit. And the other thing is the implementation is really the start of your story. This is a 10 to 15 year program. I and mean, we people don't buy WMS, TMS, ERP, any of the big enterprise softwares and, and do it willy nilly. I mean, it is a major implementation. I like to talk about, you know, uh, a WMS is like a kidney transplant. An ERP is probably like a heart lung transplant, but it's a big deal. You don't want to do them very often. So focus on this being an ongoing process. Continuous improvement really applies here. So Michael, you've got some questions maybe? Hello? Did you not hear what I had to say? No, I did not. <laughs> I what said everybody is muted, including myself. Oh, okay. uh, but feel free to use the Q&A and the chat bar. And uh, we do have a couple of questions. So number one, um, eight years ago, uh, we purchased a uh, WMS system. And uh, if we were to go out to bid today, uh, what, what's the biggest change we've seen in the uh, WMS landscape? I think the biggest change in the WMS landscape is twofold. One, one is how much customization are they willing to do and is appropriate to do. You'll find that customization story a lot lower. When we do some of these evaluations, we look at it and say, you know, do you do this? Do you have this capability? You know, the one answer is yes, we do, which means yes, I have it. I do it one way. I hope you like it. Or they might tell us, yes, I have it. It's 
it's configurable. Configurable means I have a way to allow, to behave differently, for you to tell me to behave differently without making me write new code. And then the last one is, yes, no, no, I don't, but I'll write it for you. That gets into all kinds of support related issues and going forward. In eight to 10, 15 years ago, we used to do that all the time. We really didn't care. Nowadays, especially with cloud-based solutions, whether they be single tenant or multi-tenant, upgrades and software maintenance and software management gets much more difficult. The vendors are much less willing to do customizations. The other piece gets back to the point I was just making with regard to on-premise versus in the cloud. WMS is rarely uh, a multi-tenant cloud solution. Uh, you can still get them in on-premise world, uh, but it's getting harder and harder to find them that do that. Uh, TMS is often uh, capable of being in a multi-tenant client world, uh, just by the nature of that type of business. ERPs are all over the map, but generally everybody is kind of getting more and more into this cloud-based solution. It's interesting that you should say that. So I think eight years ago versus today, um, the definition of cloud multi-tenant or what I would call a uh, hosted environment um, is, is how they deploy the software. And then the other side of it is the, the purchasing of the software, perpetual, you pay it all up front with an annual maintenance or a subscription where it's just either quarterly, sometimes monthly, quarterly or annually for a, uh, a set period of time. Um, so Tom, you mentioned something, and uh, for a lot of people, you know, the word modification um, or configuration or extension. So maybe can you help um, clarify, you know, we always used to say, you know, mods were bad. What about, um, you know, uh, extensions? Are those good mods or, or, or how's that changed? Well, extensions, depending upon how it's implemented, are ways to get typically to get in and out of the software to do something that the software doesn't do. Okay. Uh, the, the, the vendors tend to say this, these are sometimes they're called access points or exits or extensions, and, and they will promise that their new versions will support those extensions. Well, yeah, the new versions will support those extensions. The difficulty is in the detail. How will they support those extensions? And did you change the how? Uh, but it is a little bit uh, less threatening. Modifications is I'm writing new custom code just for you. Those, uh, and I do tend to think that in today's world, those are bad. Uh, configuration to me is the best answer when you tell me whether you can do something because you're telling me I have a choice. In some places I have a choice in how your software will behave for me. And that choice doesn't cause custom code. Yeah. Did that answer it, Michael? Yeah, and, and I think uh, we, we've got a question on the, the chat here too. Um, so I think where we were, you know, nine, 10 years ago, um, right, wrong, wrong, different, ERP, WMS, tell us how you do it and we'll make the software execute like you want. And that was where, you know, there was a lot of customization and extensions or they called it RISIS, right? Reports, interfaces, customizations, extensions, and um, forms. And today, right, wrong, or indifferent, the evolution of cloud implementations take it Salesforce or Workday, where it is a multi-tenant enterprise offering, and it's a templatized approach where because it's multi-tenant, everybody gets the same functionality, it's upgrading the snap. So the gap between what was a, you know, a whiteboard marker ERP implementation to a CRM or a um, HR solution that you can't make modifications to, um, what we're finding is the ERP vendors today are saying, hey, I don't want my upgrade uh, to be very, very expensive and intrusive. So I'll create certain exit points. And then if we need to do extensions, fine, you'll go out of an exit point, do a call, run a program, bring the results back in and that way you don't have to adjust the software you can take the upgrades but now instead of doing a bunch of modifications and extending the acceptance testing and and those types of things now the base code is the same and then you just got to do a little bit of work on those extensions so i think it's it's um the evolution of incorporating more of a cloud-based approach to uh software implementations 
is Brent, kind of my, yeah. my thoughts. But to your point, you know, nine years ago um, and now today, software companies' willingness, you know, is lower to do customizations. Is there anything else you want to add on that, Tom? Yeah, well, I, I agree with you totally, Michael, and, and it kind of raises what was probably the topic for another webinar someday is the idea of how you tie all these pieces together and, and what is the overall IT architecture for the enterprise. Uh, today, a lot of people, almost everybody, has what I call an ERP-centric IT architecture. We have this ERP. It's supposed to do everything. It doesn't, so I will bolt on a best of breed or I will integrate with a legacy thing or a homegrown thing that gives me some, some something that I feel is very differentiated for my business. The other side of that approach is to look at a, a message-based or a uh, enterprise service bus or enterprise application integration centric world, which says, I'm going to have common standard interfaces between these different pieces that I want to hook together, typically ERP and maybe some other bolt-ons, but I'm going to go after the extensions in the integration space. And uh, when I was early in the days of warehouse management, uh, doing those custom systems, I would bury modifications in the integrations because I always had to do integrations. I would avoid to try, I would do that to avoid getting my software guys to open the hood on a piece of software and make changes inside that software. One, it made it unique. And two, every time they made a change, they usually broke something. And so my startup was a little more tough. So, that, that that flavor of architecture is also a play here. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, hey, uh, in the interest of time, if we go to the next slide, we want to thank everybody for taking their time and attendance today. If you want to learn more, um, you can schedule an Alpine Supply Chain Systems Best Practice Assessment. Um, you can contact Alpine about that. And as I said, this will be available on our website uh, with the slides as well. If you go to the next slide, uh, please be on the lookout, February 17th, uh, 2021. We're going to go war and peace. And please know that peace is spelled incorrectly because this is our book seminar series. But uh, we're planning for every part. So thinking about all the raw materials in your network, where they need to be to ensure that you can manufacture and execute that appropriately. So on the behalf of the entire Alpine team, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time today. All the attendees, we appreciate you taking the time and look forward to seeing you guys on future seminars. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.